Two ways not to walk. Number one, as sinners. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Move on to verse, verse 17. Now, because this is so important, notice the terminology that Paul used. He says, therefore this, and this word makes it emphatic. That is, he's emphasizing this verse as so important. It ties everything together. Verse 17, therefore this I say, and notice he just doesn't say I say, but he uses another word, I testify, I bear witness. Now, this is important because Paul's saying, this is not something that I've heard from someone else. This is not something that I've merely read and perhaps didn't understand. But this is the truth of God, which he has applied to his life, and he can testify, bear witness, that it is a reality for him. He has experienced this. And therefore, we should as well want to experience that by applying it in the same way. Look on, verse 17. Therefore, this I say, and I testify in the Lord, that you are to no longer walk as the Gentiles. Now, let's pause for a moment. You know, what's this word Gentile? Well, in the New Covenant, what it's referring to is one who has no covenantal relationship with God, who has no relationship with him, no understanding. A Gentile in this day and age has to do with one who is following idolatry. And what's the motivation of idolatry? Idolatry is whereby you approach some man-made uh, idol for the purpose, the belief, the hope that somehow that idol and how you respond to him in that certain way that someone tells you that you'll get what you want. So these idols, they all have a certain power to them, supposedly. And, and that's what it's all about, me getting what I want. But notice the difference here. It says, no longer are you to walk in the same way as the Gentiles walk. He says, how? In the, the, the vanity of their mind. Now, this is important because it shows us the source, the base for all of the idolatry. It begins within the mindset, the thought process of man. What's this idol? It's what one individual came up with, his thoughts. And what's it rooted in? Well, we can go back up. Remember those uh, dice? Remember that trickery, the, the methodology of the enemy? That, that understands the, the desires, the inclination of a sinful person, one who is in bondage of sin. And, and idol worshipers, they are an individual that is trying to fulfill that desire for, for their, their wants, and it's rooted in sin. So the outcome is this, that we have to learn that there's a change required, that we no longer walk and walk as synonymous with lifestyle according to the vanity, the emptiness, the futility, however you want to translate that word, of their minds, or in this case, our minds. Now, why is our minds such a problem? Why is it that I never think right? Well, notice what happens. Verse 18. Number two, as fools. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. So look on to verse 15. He uses a very important phrase. Now, Paul is speaking here, but this is one of the favorite terms that Messiah uses, and normally he used it in regard to his discussion and teaching and prophesying about the last days. What is that? He says, uh, watch out. Now, if God's warning us, and that's what he's doing, we should take it to heart. And it's only when we have our lives illuminated by the Holy Spirit, the light of God, then and only then are we going to be able to look out and watch for the proper things. What are we supposed to do? Verse 15, he says, therefore, watch and walk. How? Well, he uses a word. And this Greek word, as I was doing research you come away with a variety of English terms. But as I was checking it out in the Hebrew language, I came across this phrase, be'ofen hanachon bidiyuk, which means in a correct manner, exactly. So when he says, watch out, it's a warning. There is a supposition, there is an expectation by God 
that we walk how? Exactly in the correct manner. And that's what he means when he says, be ye perfect. We're called to be like him, the light of the world. And therefore, he has some very stern expectations. He says, therefore, watch out how you walk. Do so in a way that is exactly correct and not as the unwise, but as the wise. Now, pay attention to this word for wisdom. You know, the Bible, it talks about knowledge. It speaks about understanding. It talks about judgment, that is being able to discern a situation. And also we have this word wisdom. And each of these words are somewhat different. When it speaks about wisdom, wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is dependent upon knowledge from a biblical standpoint, but it is not knowledge in and of itself. Wisdom is the ability to put knowledge into action. Now, you might know a lot of things. I was talking to a, a young boy, and he loves baseball. And uh, I asked him a question. And he answered that question by first running through all these facts, all these statistics, and all of them were true. They were all factual, but they weren't really related to my question. Finally, he arrived to it. Now, he was just giving a whole bunch of information. Now, it's fine to have that information, but wisdom is the ability. It's rooted in discernment as well, being able to discern what is the proper knowledge for a given situation. And then, here's what wisdom really is, the ability and the knowledge to apply that to a given situation. And that's what God expects from us. And let me tell you, you will never be so wise in and of yourself. You will never have so much knowledge, discernment, judgment, intelligence, understanding that you're able to do it based upon yourself. We're always in an absolute need of the Holy Spirit to, to teach us that, to grant us that wisdom, to know what knowledge to take, when to take it, and how to use it, and apply it to what situation. And that's what he's talking about here. So he says, do not be against wisdom, but rather be wise. Redeeming, verse 16.